Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective Live. It's Blur's Day. That's, uh, I saw that from our good fan, Kathy Gilmore, in our live comments. It's Blur's Day. Very funny. Very funny. Uh, it actually is Thursday. I have checked that three or four times today already. What day is it? I forget. Uh, it's Thursday. I was a little confused. I thought it might be Sunday because we had pizza tonight. That's usually Sunday night, but... Who the F cares when you're in a quarantine? Uh, welcome back, everybody. We have a fantastic guest for you tonight. Another Tony Award winner, David Henry Huang, M. Butterfly, Chinglish. This past season's very provocative and very entertaining soft power at the public. Great guy, does television, does film, does everything. Very active with the American Theater Wing, of course. Uh, he's going to tell us what he's up to. He lives just a few blocks from a hospital, actually. And uh, I don't know about you, we were just talking about this 7 o'clock ritual here in New York City and all over where you bang your pots and pans in celebration of all those uh, health workers that are risking their lives, literally, for all of us right now uh, as we continue to fight this virus. And it seems like the more I hear, we got this thing up against the ropes at least. At least it's a fair effing fight right now with this little thing. So we're going to keep fighting by keeping our distance. We're going to stay safe, stay healthy, and stay home. We're going to keep our distance from everybody. That's right. This is like an introvert's dream. Introvert's dream, because believe it or not, I'm actually an introvert. I know, as I lean forward into my own personal live stream. I am an introvert. It's, it's amazing. I can walk down the street now and just be like, just look the other way, just totally head down. I can see someone coming and literally walk across the street to avoid them. I sometimes do that when there is no virus rampaging its way through this country. And now I can do it and I'm like, you know, oh, look at that guy, he's doing the right thing. So stay away from people, everybody, stay away from people. Uh, don't forget, we're doing this also to draw attention to that wonderful organization, the Actors Fund. I haven't seen that little tip jar move in the last day or so. Give it a nudge if you can. Give something today. We made a couple of big announcements. The big one today, and this I'm going to tell you something. I, I have some pretty good ideas every once in a while. This idea was not mine. This idea was our producer's idea. Mary, Mary, say hello. Come in and say hello to everybody. Come on, do that thing where we do this thing. Wow. <laughs> wow. There's Mary, everybody. This was her idea. Mary, what is happening on Sunday night, on Easter Sunday? Tell everybody. We are reuniting the cast of Godspell from 2011. We're reuniting the cast of Godspell. 20 okay, Mary, go. you can go away now. I know you're, <laughs> you're keeping on. So, uh, yes, we are bringing back. We have almost the full cast right now joining us. Hunter Parrish. Wallace, Kelly, George, Nick, Julia, Morgan, Danny Goldstein. I mean, it's going to be amazing. We're bringing them all back. We, I don't know how we're going to fit them all in the same room. I don't even know if we actually can. But that's right. The 2011 cast of Godspell is coming back. We're going to have to bum your brainstorm some crazy things that we can do with them. Uh, so join us if you're a fan of that show, fan of those folks, uh, or just want to see what happens when we throw 12 actors in a room together online. It's going to be fun. Uh, also, we announced yesterday, uh, a week from tonight, next Blur's Day, we are doing a very special webinar that I'm offering just for anybody that wants to, anyone that's interested in the theater. It's called How Theater Makers Can Make the Most of Their Quarantine. That's right. We're so punny. How Theater Makers Can Make the Most of Their Quarantine. Uh, I'm going to keep this webinar, which is all derived and all the tips I've been getting, not only from everyone who's joined this live stream, but all the people that I've been talking to every single day, I literally call people and I'm like, what are you doing? How are you getting through it? How are you going to make sure you're going to be better off when we're through this sucker? And they're giving me, they're telling me their secrets and stuff. So I'm just going to share them with you next Thursday. It's stuff that's helping me get through it, uh, including this live stream is one of them. Uh, and this was someone else's idea. I, I just take on idea, other people's ideas. Just feel them. But I guess the whole, that's my career. That's not, anyway. Enough of me telling you my secrets about stealing other people's ideas. Let's get to a man who has a lot of original ideas himself, wins awards for them, Mr. David Henry Huang. Welcome, David. Hey, thanks for having me on, on the webcast. I, you know what? I just did this big pitch about you winning awards, and the award that I can see in the back there that is the most prominent is 
the greatest dad. Yeah, well, you know, first of all, it's slightly embarrassing that my camera set up against my ego wall in the first place. And so um, at least like, you know, my kids gave me that when they were little. Um, I think they still like me. Um, so I think I can I can still put that up. But Ken, how do you keep your hair so great looking? Like, you know, none of the rest of us can get haircuts. You just just wait. It's coming. I mean, can you see? I, I was just actually I was just doing this to Mary earlier. Like you can see that gray like coming in now big time. Big so time. distinguished. Yeah, no, it's gonna be it's gonna be like that in a few weeks. Uh, how old are your kids now? Um, my daughter is 19 and she's, uh, she's a freshman in college, but her school, uh, got it. It was one of the first to kind of sh shut down. So she's been home about four and a half weeks and now she's taking classes online. And my son is 24 and he's sheltering with his girlfriend's family in Salem, Massachusetts. Ah, having some witch trial while they're there. Yep. <laughs> that's what, that's what they're famous for. What, what do you, what do your kids think about having a dad who's a famous playwright. How does that, are they in the arts? Um, no, um, I think, you know, my, my daughter's quite young, so we'll see what she ends up going into. She's interested in writing, but, uh, and my son was, uh, played four years of college football. That was his thing. Oh. It was so surprising, right? Um, <laughs> but he was a kicker, so it's a relatively safe position, but he he played uh, four years as the, as the uh, starting kicker on his team. and. Uh, uh, we think he's interested in video editing now, so he will maybe pursue that. I love it. He rebelled against his artistic father by, by becoming a jock. Yeah, it's karma. I became a playwright. My parents knew nothing about that, and so it was only fair that my son became a jock. I love it. So uh, everyone good with you? Healthy, happy? You're hunkered down in Brooklyn, that's right? Yeah, knock on wood. We're, you know, we're in Fort Greene. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we live about two blocks from Brooklyn Hospital, um, and um, so there have been a fair number of articles on the front page of the New York Times over the past week or so about Brooklyn Hospital. We love them, um, it's, and so therefore when we go out and do the seven o'clock thing and we're clapping, uh, we feel extra good because maybe they can hear it. And a lot of the healthcare workers uh, park on our block and stuff like that. Amazing. And what are you doing to keep busy? Did you have, did you have stuff that was interrupted by the sucker? Tell so me. I'm really fortunate that I didn't have a production this spring. Um, my most recent production is um, Soft Power, which you mentioned, thank you. And um, we, but no, I was, I wasn't, I was planning on having kind of a quiet spring, which I guess it's gotten even quieter. But, um, you know, writers are fortunately one of the few people in the uh, arts and, I mean, in theater and film and television who are still working. Um, so, and we're, it's a pretty safe profession. The, the New York Times a few weeks ago did this chart about, you know, what professions are most dangerous in terms of being exposed um, and like writers are way down in the bottom left corner next to loggers. <laughs> so if I was a logger, I would be slightly more safe. Um, but so I'm working on, you know, I have a, a bunch of uh, projects I'm working on. We're continuing to uh, uh, work on soft power and um, we have great commercial producers who are really uh, uh, supportive of us and really enthusiastic. So uh, we're gonna, you know, we're taking what we learned from New York and um, continuing to rewrite and rethink and reconceptualize. And then uh, I'm working on a screenplay uh, for Disney, which is uh, the live action um, musical feature version of Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, and then we're doing a new um, Aida for theater um, with Disney Theatrical, uh, which we were in the middle of a two-week workshop for that. So that did get shut down because mm -hmm. uh, that got put on hiatus. Um, and all my, I have an opera of, an uh, opera version of M. Butterfly that hopefully will still open at Santa Fe Opera uh, this summer. Um, and I, uh, in my last few months of a four-year term as chair of the American Theater Wing, so that's taking up a lot of time, obviously, at this. It's very complicated now for a lot of people, and there's so much need out there. 
Uh, and I also run the MFA playwriting program at Columbia. Uh, and so of course we've had to adjust uh, and I end up on Zoom, not this particular platform, but something very much like it uh, for most of the day. So I feel like I'm basically as busy as I used to be. It's just, I'm on Zoom and there's no commuting time. Ah, very interesting benefit from all this. Do you think that you will, coming out of this, will you actually do more Zooms than appear in person in place? You're like, you know what, we, we did pretty well during that thing. I might as well just Zoom and save myself 45 minutes on a train. I think there's some ways in which, as you know, since we're getting comfortable with this medium, we were already kind of moving in that direction, uh, certainly with FaceTime and uh, just being comfortable having remote meetings. And I think we will be that much more comfortable. On the other hand, uh, I don't know about you, but I find being on Zoom, at least right now, a little tiring. Like I don't want to mm -hmm. have two, like maybe I can do three meetings a day and I need some time between them. Um, so there is also, I, I think it is also likely that when this is over, we will really uh, uh, release the craving that we have for human contact, which has been repressed during this period. Yeah, I t I'm totally with you on both of those things, especially the Zoom. I would actually call it now not zoning out, but Zooming out. Like after a while, you're just like, I, I cannot stare at the screen anymore. I have to take a massive break. Uh, you do so, so many things, which is why I, I mean, I love how you switch gears. Is there one medium, opera, musical, started as a player in television film that you if you had to choose one, what would you do for the rest yeah. of your life? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm fundamentally a playwright. Um, that's what I started out doing. That's where I tell the most personal stories. Um, that's closest to my heart and the, the, the medium where I feel I can just do what I want. Um, that said, it's pretty hard to make, you know, you have to find a way to make a living. Like even really successful playwrights uh, I, it's, I, I, I would be hard pressed to find someone who makes their living just as a playwright. Um, so I think it's a good idea. And I tell my students this as well to kind of diversify, have a toolkit of skills that you can use to make a living, which hopefully you can find a great deal of satisfaction in those areas as well. It, some, working on projects that you weren't necess you didn't necessarily initiate, but you find a way to connect to them so that they're still meaningful to you and you're still able to explore yourself artistically even when you're working on other people's projects. Mm. Will you write about this? Will you write about this crazy period that we're in in some way, shape, or form? I mean, everything seems to end up in the work, so I don't have a specific plan on how to do that right now, but it seems likely since, uh, you know, I hope, I, I don't think, I'm not planning on writing another play or show with the, you know, DHH character as, as uh, Yellowface or Soft Power, but I can't imagine that this experience, which is so anomalous, so large, and so unprecedented in our lifetimes anyway, uh, isn't going to have an impact on my psyche and therefore on my work. How do you think it's going to impact audiences? How do you think they'll respond to, or what their appetite? You know, when when I have I don't know pizza as I did for several days in a row, I then want something totally different. What do you think they'll want when they come back? When we come back? I mean, I was feeling like twenty years ago. I I I gave a talk once where I said that. Um, the digital age would be good for theater because as these digital forms and uh, mediums became infinitely duplicatable, the live experience would become more valuable. And that doesn't only apply to theater, it applies to you know sporting events and to con live concerts and all these things that we can't do now. Um, so in the same way that we're talking about, yeah, when we get off Zoom, we might really just want to see each other. Um, when we, uh, when we are able to ease social distancing, I think there will be a great repressed need for the type of community and um, human contact 
that uh, theater provides. That said, it may take a while for people not to be afraid to, you know, sit, especially in, in Broadway houses. Um, but obviously, if there's a vaccine or, or a cure, that will that will really help. So there may be a sort of a transition period. Um, but I, I want to believe, and I do believe, that the need for live theater will come back even more strongly. You mentioned that your students and your teaching to Columbia. What's the one common note you have to give to student writers? Like, what what's the common flaw you see in all the early career scripts that you're like, oh, here it is again. It's the old problem. I mean, I think the most. I'm going to sort of try to put it in a positive thing sense in terms of what I want my students and all writers really uh, to to go for what I look for when I go to Broadway or when I read a play by a student writer. It's that sense of um, an individual voice of passion of need to write this thing and that it's uh, a, an artist who is taking what makes them uh, different, what makes them idiosyncratic, what makes them weird, and uh, exploring that through their art, because that's the piece that only that person can make. Um, and so I guess what the mistake would be um, is um, trying to write something that feels just like you saw it and you want to write something that imitates what you saw, but maybe doesn't have anything to do with who you really are inside because then what's the point really? So people that see M. Butterfly go like, oh, I want to write that. I just want to write something just like that. That's not the way we should do it. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, uh, that said, I'm really interested in borrowing forms. Like I, you know, something like Soft Power is very much a riff off of uh, The King and I or, mm -hmm. uh, and Butterfly obviously riffs off of Madam Butterfly. So I'm interested in forms, but how do you, if you're gonna do that, how do you remake them in a way that's uniquely you? Will you tell everyone, I, I, this, I don't know if you, I've ever told you this, but I tell everyone this story about the first time you heard and Butterfly read. Will you just, yeah. like, you know, everyone knows you, it's, it's plays are workshopped and read, but with this play, your first play on Broadway, the first time you ever heard it was when? It was the first day of rehearsal for the Broadway production. And uh, it's it's kind of crazy uh, nowadays when you think about the sort of amount of uh, workshopping and rewriting, which I, I believe in, uh, that goes into uh, any show that makes it to Broadway. But uh, in this particular case, I wrote a play, there was a very, uh, brave producer who's uh, still still happily with us named Stuart Ostro um, and he just he loved the play he wanted to take a chance on it um, and he was a big gambler he was willing to roll the dice he got an amazing director John Dexter who had done the original production of Eclipse as well as many other things um, John and I had met and that led to, you know, I did, I probably did two sets of rewrites before we went into rehearsal, but I never actually heard the play until the first day of rehearsal for the Broadway production. And were you nervous about that? Were you like, we haven't read this thing? Are you crazy? Or was it just like, I guess this is what we're doing. I don't know. Let's do it. I mean, I, at that point, I had done one, two, three, four, five shows off Broadway already. I did four shows at the public and one show at second stage. And so it's not like, I wasn't a complete newbie to the process. Um, and I guess in general, we didn't workshop as much in those days. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it was a big deal and I was nervous and excited and everything. This was my first Broadway show, but everybody seemed like, that's okay to do it that way. So I was like, fine. What if I came to you tomorrow and was like, David, you got a new play? And you were like, yeah, I have something right here. And I was like, let's just do it on Broadway. Would you agree to that today? Or would you be like, Ken, that may have worked way back when, but it doesn't work in today's world. Well, 
I mean, of course I would agree to it because it, <laughs> that's a great opportunity. Um, I would then go, hey, maybe we should do a reading before, because I just want to hear it at this point. Yeah. And, and I'm very, in, you know, I believe in rewriting. Uh, oh, well, that brings up, a, um, we'll go to some questions now. And how timely, that last question there, Christopher Scott asks, how do you know when to put down your pen? And to yeah. stop rewriting. What a great question, Chris. That is, that's a great question. Um, so I probably, so Lee Silverman, who I believe has also been on this, this yeah. uh, podcast, or what is this, a streaming, whatever we call it. Um, uh, Lee has been my main director and my artistic partner now for ooh, uh, since Yellowface, and oh, we started working on it in 06, so you know, a good 14 years. And <laughs> Lee often says that you know the day that they make me stop rewriting is the saddest day of my life. That is, um, you know, because at some point they'll go okay, you have to freeze the script now because you know critics are coming in three days and the actors need to do it a few times without making any changes. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's it. So, you know, there's this saying that uh, scripts are not finished, they're abandoned, which is probably what I feel. Uh, and it makes it hard for me to see plays after their, my shows after they're done because I always go, oh, I could still fix that. Mm. Um, so, but of course there, you know, the, you have to find a way to put the pen down. And basically I try to, I get the play as finished as I can, uh, just working with the pen and the computer and um, or I have a draft. And when I get that draft, I'm like, okay, this is good. Um, I'm happy with this. And then I need to hear it because writing a play is a little like writing music. For me anyway, I'm less interested in the words on the page than I am in how they sound on the air. So I need to hear it. And then inevitably I hear it and I go, oh, that doesn't work, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. And then I start to rewrite. And I rewrite all through rehearsals. Um, just watching the actors do it and, and, and kind of trying to feel, oh, that doesn't, that feels fake. And did I write that? And then, um, and then we go into previews. Uh, I get it as, as you know, finished as I can before previews and then previews start. And then the audience teaches you so much. I thought that was funny, but nobody's laughing. So that's not the audience's fault. Um, and you rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. And then at some point they make you stop. You mentioned Lee Silverman and you called her your artistic partner. Why? Like, what about Lee was like, oh, this is someone I'm going to artistically marry this person and do everything with her. Like, what What about it? Um, you know, and I've told this, Lee and I have told the story together, so I don't think I'm telling anything that she wouldn't uh, approve of. But, uh, you know, Oscar Eustace, uh, the artistic director of the Public Theater, put us together um, as p a potential director for my play Yellowface. And our first meeting didn't actually go that well. I felt mm -hmm. like, oh, she doesn't really understand the piece. But then I went home and I thought about it some more and I realized, oh, the things that she doesn't understand are the things that aren't yet clear about the play. And then I really kind of respected her and trusted her. And we decided to you know, work together on Yellowface and that went so well that uh, now we, you know, we have a shorthand and we're very comfortable and we can say anything to each other. Um, but she's, you know, so smart about script. Um, so many of the, the major and minor changes that have happened to my scripts along the way are because of suggestions from Lee. Um, she works harder than anybody. She squeezes every last second out of rehearsal. Um, and, you know, and I throw a bunch of like impossible challenges at her and she's excited to embrace them. Uh, Chinglish, okay, we're gonna do a, a comedy that's a, a quarter in Mandarin with surtitles. Yeah, or soft power. We're gonna do a play that becomes a musical. And then Janine Tesori comes in and writes the music and Janine wants a 23 piece orchestra. And we're all like, Lee's like, yeah. That, it, so. You know, it's um, it, it's been a great partnership. I think it's allowed us both to stretch artistically. I, I always feel like 
I have a second chapter, you know, there that Fitzgerald quote, there are no second chapters in American, second acts in American lives. And I feel like I have a second act largely because of Lee. She's fantastic. Uh, I'm, and I was very fortunate to be a producer on Chinglish and that's where I met yeah, you. Yeah, thank and, you. And her. Uh, Drew asks, 823 there, Mary, do you as a writer ever have a fear of competing against your previous successes? Hmm. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say compete so much. I feel that there is, you know, I've been doing this for like 40 years now. So uh, there was a time, particularly because M. Butterfly looms so large as a title in my life, where I was like, okay, I need to, you know, do another M. Butterfly or, and at a certain point I realized, you know, these, the first of all, you can only have your first Broadway hit once. And second of all, um, th that's not why we're doing this as artists. We're not doing this so we can have a hit. Of course we want a hit, but that's not the purpose of, uh, of writing. We're writing so that, or I'm writing anyway, so I can explore things that I need to explore um, and um, create new works that excite me. Um, and then as long as I can do that, uh, which I've been fortunate now to do for, you know, 30 years since I'm Butterfly, then that's the gift. And some of the hits and some of them won't. What's your biggest tip for folks on getting through this crazy time and keeping whatever people are working on going forward? How are you doing it? Wow. Um, biggest tip. I personally am very interested in the uplifting stories. The story, you know, it's not it's not hard for me to when I, you know, I'm very sad for for the tragic stories, of course. But what inspires me are the people who um, are taking this moment and showing bravery and showing courage and showing selflessness. That's why one of the reasons the seven o'clock thing is so exciting and inspiring, that people in these terrible moments can rise to uh, the best version of themselves. And those sort of stories and those people are what really um, helped me get through this moment. Thank you for helping us get through this moment just by joining us here tonight. Your words Thank are all you. about smart and uh, inspiring. So we love to have you here. Thanks for being here and good luck. And I look forward to seeing you very soon in person. And in person. I'll have, a, have a good meal and a stiff drink. Yes, exactly. We'll see you soon, David. Thanks for having me here. David Henry Huang, everybody. Incredibly talented guy and very, very insightful. The uplifting stories, that's what he wants us to focus on. Uh, that's what to find now. It'll help you get through this. And who knows, maybe you'll be inspired to write something about one of those uplifting stories. Speaking of uplifting stories, we've got Godspell reuniting on Easter Sunday. Can you believe it? On Easter Sunday, this Sunday, how apropos, Godspell, that cast is getting Getting back together. You could say we're getting the band back together again. Godspell here on this live stream, Sunday night, 8 o'clock, same time, same place. Don't forget, we're doing that free webinar next Thursday. Just go ahead, go to that link. Mary will throw it up, and you can register and sign up. What else? Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay home. Don't forget. Actors Fund, don't forget. What else? Oh, Something to make you smile about, right? Something to make you smile. What do we got this week, this day? I keep forgetting this show is daily. We're going to be here. What do we got for you? We got dogs. We got puppies. We got puppy dogs. We got go to, go to the producers perspective.com backslash smile and just watch some dogs and a great voiceover. It's a, it's a, you know, we try to find things that, oh, you caught me like rubbing my nose there. You kind of, we, <laughs> shoot. We try to find things that are have to do with the theater or dramatic, and we couldn't. And then I realized this guy actually did a very dramatic, actor-like, funny comic voiceover. Watch that thing. Smile, and we will see you tomorrow night. Who do we have tomorrow night? 
my good buddy, Tony from Freestyle Love Supreme. So you know what that means. Expect some beatboxing from this guy right here tomorrow night. I will not freestyle. I'll leave it to Tony uh, tomorrow night. He is wild. If you haven't seen it, if you saw Freestyle Love Supreme, you know, talk about inspiring, talk about fun. He'll be with us tomorrow night. Who knows what's going to happen? No, it's boots and cuts and boots. That's how you do it. He'll teach you how to do it tomorrow night. Join me then. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.